Hello again. I'm now back for our second short lecture on quantitative PCR. And what I'll be covering now is what we call real-time PCR, continuous monitoring of the amplification of our PCR product. And furthermore, I'll be talking about what we call the delta CT method to calculate the ratio or if you like, the fold difference between the specific DNA amounts that we have in two different samples, or actually more in several samples. So in our previous lecture, I told you about what I'd like to call the poor man's PCR, that is a way to determine the fold difference of uh, the DNA in two samples using a conventional PCR machine. And as I told you, this got its limitations. But still, the principle was that when you PCR amplify a particular sequence, you initially double the amount of that DNA with every PCR cycle. So if a ratio between the amount of DNA in two samples is known or is present, then this ratio, like a 4 to 1 ratio, that's what we used in the last lecture, this ratio will be maintained over the initial PCR cycles. Because if you double the amount of DNA in one sample and you double the amount that you got in the other sample, the ratio between the two, the fold difference between the two, will be maintained. And that's something that we can take advantage of because that means we can now amplify in both tubes our target DNA while maintaining the ratio and we amplify it to the point where we can now detect it, say, on a gel. So at least if everything is true that I just told you, the ratio in band intensities that you see on that gel will reflect the initial ratio uh, of the DNA template that we had in our samples. However, that's not entirely accurate. And the problem, as I told you before, is saturation. The problem is that, yes, you initially double the amount of your uh, template DNA, but once you reach a certain amount, a certain concentration of PCR product, it's no longer true. Then you don't double it anymore with every cycle. Perhaps you only amplify it 1.5 fold, and you know later on during the later PCR cycles, you hardly double you or you hardly amplify it at all. Instead, the amount of your PCR product will then remain the same, and that means. If you just let the amplification go, then all of your samples will reach a similar final amount, the saturation amount, and this will no longer reflect any initial differences that you had in the amount of your template DNA in the initial samples. So how can you overcome that problem? Well, you do that by continuously monitoring the amplification of your DNA. So as I said, if you, all you have is a conventional PCR machine, you can do that by taking out the tubes, you know, every couple of cycles and then analyze what's in there. This is very inconvenient. It's also quite inaccurate because you have to run gels and try to quantitate intensities. So what you rather do when you do truly quantitative PCR is to continuously monitor the amplification of your DNA with a method that uh, usually relies on fluorescence. So what you need for that is a PCR setup that allows you to send light into the tube in order to excite the fluorescence. And you also need to retrieve the light that's coming out of the tube in order to detect and quantify that. And the most popular method to do just that is to buy one of those um, fairly expensive machines that we call real-time PCR machines. That's basically a heating block like in a conventional PCR machine coupled to a fluorescence 
excitation and detection device. So, if I may draw this for you for a second, if you allow me, here we go. I just need a pen. So, the idea is that I not only have a tube with my PCR sample and where I can change the temperature as I need it for PCR, so something like 92 degrees for denaturation, 55 degrees for annealing of the primers and 72 degrees for polymerization. No, you not only got that, but in, dish, in addition to that, you can excite the fluorescence with some blue light that you send in there. And this will then result in fluorescence and the fluorescent light is then no longer blue, it's got a longer wavelength and typically it's green. And that green light you filter and you reflect and you finally uh, detect this and quantitate this and there are several technologies available for that. So that's basically the kind of uh, PCR that I'm talking about now and that we use to quantitate DNA. So might ask perhaps, okay, but uh, how can I make the DNA fluorescent? And that's a very good question because normally it wouldn't do that for you. You need to uh, be more sophisticated. Uh, you, you need to do this more carefully. So I show you how it works. Um, this is the DNA that you typically amplify. So this is double-stranded DNA. On top of that, you also got single-stranded DNA. That's your primers. Those are single-stranded. So in order to make that fluorescent, you add a dye. And the dye that is most popular for that is called cyber green. Cyber green is a dye that you add to your PCR mix. But the particular feature of cyber green is that it will only become fluorescent once it binds to double-stranded DNA. So the double-stranded DNA is fluorescent but not the single-stranded DNA and that means you can continuously monitor the amplification of your double-stranded DNA because only the double-stranded DNA as shown here, only the double-stranded DNA will become fluorescent. That's in a nutshell the idea of cyber green mediated monitoring of the DNA amplification. So what will you detect with your device now, with this uh, fluorescent device? Well, again, I'd like to show you my favorite, my favorite coordinate system. So I first need a white pen for that. Here we go. So this is the intensity that I detect. And as I told you already, the intensity is now corresponding to the amount of double-stranded DNA in my sample. So it's the PCR product. And this is now continuously being monitored over the PCR cycles. So just for simplicity, let me just show you the first couple of cycles. That's the way it looks like. So this is cycle number one, cycle number two, cycle number three, and so on. And uh, let's assume that, in, uh, like, in, like in our previous example, uh, we start in our sample B, we start with one unit, and in our, our sample number A, sample A, we start with four units of DNA. And as before, we now monitor the amplification. So at least in the initial phases, we can double this amount. So we now reach some eight units. And here we even reach some uh, 16 units of double-stranded DNA. Now, with the sample number that contained eight, four units of the initial uh, DNA. We now amplify this in our first round to eight units and in our second round to 16 units. We now just take the 
amounts of DNA at a particular time. We can do this at cycle number two, for instance, here. And since the ratio of the two samples will be maintained, all we need to do is to quantitate the intensity of fluorescence at this particular cycle and then divide those two intensities and that will provide me with an idea of what the initial ratio has been. So we can do that and I show you on the next slide how it looks like in the real world. In the real world we get something like that and in the real world this reflects 10 different samples of uh, our PCR product, uh, ten, 10 different samples that we subjected to um, quantitative PCR and as you see initially almost nothing was detectable. Our fluorescence detection device just wouldn't monitor anything but now here the first sample started to become detectable. This orange line here is a bit more than the detection threshold and what you see here is that this blue line first detect, uh, crosses this uh, threshold. So this one is amplified first and in the case of the additional samples amplification that becomes detectable starts a bit later and the same is true for the other samples. This one is the sample that had, what do you think, highest or lowest amount of DNA? Huh? Well, of course, this sample had the lowest amount of our template DNA because it took most PCR cycles to amplify this for becoming detectable. And this one here, this sample, started with the highest amount of template, so the amplification product became, became detectable with the lowest amounts of PCR cycle. That's the way we look at that. Now let's try what we tried previously on the blackboard. That is to pick just some PCR cycle. Pick just some PCR cycle. Say cycle number 28. Okay. And just look at the amount of amplification product that we obtained at that stage. So what you see is that for a few samples you can actually observe that the PCR product is more concentrated, is higher in amounts and reflecting a higher degree of intensity, of fluorescence intensity, when you were starting with a sample that presumably had a higher amount of template. So that works more or less. However, what you see here is, however, what you see here is that our first sample already was reaching saturation. So probably we are now underestimating the amount of template that we really had in our sample. Whereas other samples, those three, they won't give us a detectable signal at all. So we might think there is nothing in there, but indeed we do have a template DNA, it just would be amplified later. So using just one of these cycles for monitoring all the DNA quantities is a less than perfect idea. So maybe we can think about something better.